It's Tuesday, September 18th, 2012. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson, and this is the InfoWars Nightly News. Tonight on the InfoWars Nightly News, Jakari Jackson speaks with a Noble Live filmmaker, Holland Vanden Neuenhoff, about the potential for upcoming false flag terror. Plus, a historic battle between the judicial and executive looms as Obama's White House pushes its unconstitutional dictatorship on unsuspecting Americans. Then, the DHS purchases 200 million more rounds of ammo. All that and more on the InfoWars Nightly News. Welcome back. Top story headline. Government wins temporary freeze of military detention order. This is a very scary thought, meaning that they had just passed this in the first place. The government won an emergency suspension of a ruling that blocked the indefinite military detention of terrorism suspects after arguing it would hurt America's ability to fight wars overseas. An appeals court order late Monday granted a temporary stay sought by the Justice Department after a judge had ruled unconstitutional, a part of a statute that authorizes an indefinite military detention for people deemed to have substantially supported al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or associated forces. You mean like the CIA? The Justice Department argue the judge's September 12th injunction barring enforcement of a portion of the National Defense Authorization Act's homeland battlefield provision would harm the U.S. war efforts abroad. I seem to be a bit confused of how a homeland battlefield provision keeps you from handling business overseas. You turn the homeland into a battlefield and that somehow keeps you from getting some terrorist in some far off country who probably doesn't even exist or you've killed three or four times. Uh, it's, it's pretty much a ridiculous scenario. And we had just won a victory by having this removed. And now it's right back there less than a week later. So stay tuned to the InfoWars Nightly News. They may change it again by the end of the week and make it even worse. Uh, it, it, it's, I don't even really know what to say about this. It's really ridiculous. And we see people hard at work at keeping the NDAA alive, even though it's the Patriot Act on steroids. It's a horrible piece uh, of, I don't even know what you call it, not probably words I shouldn't call it here on the nightly news, but hopefully keep fighting good judges and get this overturned because we don't need anything like this in this country, nothing remotely like this, to where you can be snatched up in the middle of the night and disappeared into a black hole where nobody can find you. Even the FBI say they don't like this. So stay tuned to the InfoWars Nightly News as this story develops. Next story. Headline, Pentagon doesn't trust its own robots. That's right. There is a lack of trust among operators that given unmanned system will operate as intended from the Defense Science Board. One major reason, most Defense Department deployments of unmanned systems were motivated by the pressing needs of conflict, so systems were rushed to theater with inadequate support, resources, training, and concepts of operation. War may spur innovation, but it's not always the best place to beta test. That is right. Do not beta test in war. That's pretty much a, a given. Why would you do something such as that if you could avoid it at all. I mean, we see these unmanned robots that patrol your own neighborhoods now here in the U.S., and they're saying that they don't trust their own robots, but they're there to keep you safe. So, yeah, we beta test in war. They don't work right, but we'll roll them out anyway because somebody wants money, you know, so we'll just keep pushing them out. An article goes on to say about a third of the military's entire air fleet is robotic. And that makes me feel real good seeing that these robots that they don't even trust themselves <laughs> constitute a third of the air fleet. You know, it's, it's Skynet coming soon to a neighborhood near you. If you haven't seen these drones already, we have them here in Austin. Alex has seen them. Now, that particular drone that Alex saw was, uh, was operated by a gentleman. I think he was doing some kind of construction surveillance or something like that. But a lot of these drones are unmanned and they want to give them uh, AI artificial intelligence so they can deem what's a threat on their own. And they say themselves, they admit right here in this article that they don't trust their own systems. So watch out and watch for the sky is the only thing I can tell you. Moving on now. 
controversial naked airport body scanners to be scrapped after failing to receive European approval. Somebody has some sense. Well, look here. The European Commission ruled that the cancer risk was close to zero. I don't know about that. But under Brussels legislation, the three-year trial period has elapsed, and it was decided not to prioritize them for permanent use across the continent. Continuing, airport bosses who were waiting for the green light on the machines now say that they have been left with no option but to remove them. Hey, whatever your statistics tell you, uh, Brussels legislation, uh, I have a friend who's an x-ray tech, and he says when he does the does his x-rays, he stands behind a lead wall. Superman can't see behind a lead wall, but the guys at the TSA just like to stand right there next to the, the naked body scanners and get fried. And I'm not demonizing the TSA workers. I actually feel pretty sorry for them. Well, this is a little, well it's not off topic. I always say that. But actually, I, I applied for the TSA. This is way, this is probably like 2007 or 2008. I didn't know anything about them at the time. And I went and filled out an application for the TSA. And my mom, she just told me, she looked at me, she said, son, don't work there. And I didn't work there, and I don't have cancer, and I thank God to this day, and thank you, mom, for uh, making a good call on that one. So, uh, yeah, they say, their numbers say that the cancer risk is very low. Whatever you found, whatever your reason was, good for you, Europe, for kicking these things out of your country. You don't need them in your country. You don't need uh, these guys patting you up. I'm not exactly sure how things operate in Europe, if they have a... Uh, situation close to the TSA, but naked body scanners, get rid of them. And actually, if we can throw that article back up, we can take a look at what these things do. You take, you see a look right there. You, you can clearly see this man, you know, and in his uh, privates, you know, they say that these things can't see through your clothes. And yeah, keep, yeah, keep thinking that they don't keep this stuff on file. How did we get it if they don't keep this stuff on file? Ask yourself that question. How did we get that picture right there if they don't keep this stuff on file? So. Good for you, Europe. Hopefully, we can get some sense here in the States as well. Next topic. And this is also, this is probably just as important as our top story. DHS purchased 200 million more rounds of ammunition. They already have over a billion. Oh, okay, well, let me read the article. DHS purchases 200 million more rounds of ammunition. This is from our very own Paul Joseph Watson. A series of new solicitations posted on the FedBiz Ops website show that the DHS is looking to purchase 200 million rounds of 223 rifle ammunition over the next four years, as well as 176,000 rounds of 308 caliber. And let me assure you that these are some big, hard-hitting rounds. I've had a chance to shoot these myself. Uh, these, these aren't you know, little play <laughs> play rounds. These are some serious sniper ammunition. The article goes on to say that over 1.2 billion bullets have been purchased in the last six months alone. And they keep saying, yeah, we need uh, various things. We need them for target practice. We need them to do this. We need them to do that. I mean, there's only so much target practice you're going to do before you actually go into live action shooting, whatever you're shooting. I mean, even if you're a hunter, you shoot so you can go hunt or, you know, recreation or whatever it is that you do. So it's it's really a scary thing that they would go out and buy more articles all the way, all the while blacking out how much they can get. I mean, we, we get these sources where we can, but they've been blacking out uh, their bullet purchases, so maybe they have more that they've been able to hide from us. But meanwhile, if you go to the your local, you know, uh, gun store and you buy some bullets, your neighbor could snitch on you and have somebody show up at your house. I mean, it, it's ridiculous that you, you yourself as a citizen, can't arm yourself to protect yourself. And hey, if you can protect yourself, you live way out in the sticks, then there's no need for you know Sheriff May of Mayberry to come out there and see how you're doing if he knows you're strapped to the teeth. So just another example of the Obama administration's hypocrisy saying you can't have guns, but we'll load up, we'll have them. Uh, it was six bullets for one person. I don't know how many it is now. Uh, <laughs> probably empty a full clip on you now. But yeah, they keep building up and up and up. And it's something that's very discouraging. They can't even say you can smoke pot and own a gun. I'm not encouraging anybody to smoke pot. And not even encourage you to own a gun if you're not stable to. But if you are, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. I like, I like guns myself. Rambling aside, it's now time for the quote of the day. This from Frank Lloyd Wright. TV is chewing gum for the eyes. Yes, that from Mr. Frank Lloyd Wright. And I would not disagree with that with all the 
Sports Center and I don't even know what I haven't watched TV in so long. I don't even know what comes on. People say, Hey, have you seen this show? I say, I definitely have not. So if you if that's what you do, keep doing that. But after the game is off, you know, read a book or watch a documentary or something. We have several right here on the InfoWars Nightly News, uh, on the InfoWars shop, plenty that you can look at. Noble Eye, something I'll tease right now. We have a chance to do an interview later on with Holland Van den Neuenhoff, uh, you know, producer of A Noble Eye, something very interesting, so make sure you stay tuned for that. And now we're going to go to our friend David Ortiz with his report. Let's see what you have. Thank you, Jakari. For InfoWars Nightly News, I'm David Ortiz. Well, is presidential candidate Mitt Romney's campaign in serious trouble, or has it just hit a minor speed bump? Hundreds of media outlets today are focusing on comments that Mitt Romney made earlier this year at a campaign function that featured many wealthy donors. We're going to go to that soundbite and then come back with analysis. There are 47% of the people who vote for the president no matter what. All right, there are 47% who are with him, who are dependent upon government, who believe that, that they are victims, who believe that government has a responsibility to care for them, who believe that they are entitled to health care, to food, to housing, to you name it. But that's it's an entitlement, and government should give it to them. And they will vote for this president no matter what. Well, in my estimation, people are missing the bigger picture. And the bigger picture here is that you've got three groups of people all which have hurt this country severely, that are bickering amongst themselves and trying to see who can pose as the saviors of the country. Now, those three groups are the Democrats, the Republicans, and obviously the bankers. In this situation, Mitt Romney is stating that socialism has hurt this country, and certainly there's no question about that. The welfare state has hurt this country. He is right in his analysis. However, where he is wrong is that he is trying to pose as the savior, when in fact, um, he is a crony capitalist. He supports um, several wars. So the, the Republican Party um, is the party of warfare. And obviously that indebts the nation as well. So where Mitt Romney is right is obviously in criticizing this. He should not retract his statement in, in, in my estimation. But in trying to pose as the savior, in trying to get his uh, party to pose as the savior, that is where he is wrong. Obviously, the third group of people that is hurting this country is the bankers. They obviously uh, hurt our economy, and then helicopter Bernanke comes in stating he's going to help this country by printing more money. That's obviously a cover as well. So three groups of people bickering amongst each other trying to see who can be uh, positioned as the savior of the country. In other news, today on Infowars.com, Paul Joseph Watson posted an article titled U.S. Caught Creating Three New Computer Viruses. The article states researchers working for both Kaspersky and Symantec have separately discovered that the United States is almost certainly responsible for three new viruses that are being used in Lebanon and Iran to conduct espionage, having already been identified as the culprits behind the 2010 Stuxnet virus and this year's closely related flame virus. Later on in the article, it reads, Kaspersky and Stemantec experts are still unsure as to what the newly discovered viruses are designed to do, but have confirmed that they are operating in the Middle East, including Iran and Lebanon, and that the, quote, approach to uploading packages and downloading data fits the profile of military and or intelligence operations, end quote. So there you go. You've got the U.S. government saying it does not want to go to war with the Middle East, condemning the Middle East, uh, Iran specifically, and yet you have them hacking their network, according to this article, the Lebanese government and the Iranian government's network. Clearly not an action from a country that wants peace. Now, obviously, I'm not um, condoning the Iranian government and what they do. But again, this is another example of how the U.S. government is posing as our saviors, say, saying that they want peace, they don't want to go to war, yet their actions are questionable. And this comes on the heels of legislation that is in Congress that shows that the U.S. government wants to regulate the Internet. And one of the reasons that they cite as to why we should regulate the Internet is because a, a country can hack our network. So here they are um, voicing they con their concerns for an action that they themselves are doing. So um, obviously the U.S. government is trying to pick a fight with the Iranian government. In other news, Portland, Oregon approves the fluoridation of water. 
Um, according to a recent article released by the New York Times, Portland, Oregon, which never fluoridated its water supply and over time earned the distinction as the biggest city in the country to just say no, recently reversed course with a unanimous vote by the city council to add fluoride beginning in early 2014. Now, this initiative should cost the city about $5 million. Obviously, we talked at great length about the ills of fluoride and how many studies show it should not be ingested. Again, a recent Harvard study shows that by ingesting large quantities of fluoride, um, someone could lower their IQ rate by as much as 20 points. Now, there are activists in Portland that, that say they want to overturn this decision. However, they do acknowledge it's going to be extremely difficult. So if you want this uh, decision to be overturned, obviously help those in the Portland area that are trying to do so. And also in the article, it points out that the Center for Disease Control and Prevention has called the introduction of fluoride in municipal drinking water after World War II one of the 10 greatest achievements in public health of the 20th century up there with vaccination and motor vehicle safety improvements. So obviously the CDC thinks that fluoridating your water is just dandy, as are vaccinations. We obviously know otherwise. Now earlier in this segment, I talked a little bit about presidential politics, and today in New York City at New York University, former Minnesota Governor Jesse Ventura attended a public rally with presidential nominee Gary Johnson. Now we do not yet know if a formal endorsement was made at this event. Uh, neither the governor's websites um, point this out, but it's very well known that Jesse Ventura on record has uh, supported supports Gary Johnson for president, and it's good to see these two um, governors together promoting the libertarian and constitutionalist cause. So they were at a public rally today at NYU with Judge Napolitano um, talking about libertarian causes. We don't know if this led to an official endorsement, but obviously Mr. Ventura does support Mr. Johnson for president. Now, earlier this year, I had the pleasure of speaking with Mr. Johnson, and he explained to me several reasons as to why it is important to support his candidacy. Among them, this reason. If the libertarian candidate for president uh, gets 5% of the general election vote, something that has never happened before, but... I'm going to suggest that that is a, that is a real possibility. If that happens, uh, the Libertarian Party would receive $90 million in federal matching funds, which would be an absolute game changer. I am also advocating uh, on the part of the fair tax. Uh, I'm advocating throwing, or throwing out the entire federal tax system. So no more income tax, no more corporate tax, no more withholdings from your payroll check replacing all of that with the fair tax, which is a 23% consumption tax, which ends up being cost neutral over a very short amount of time. It's really the answer to making American goods and services competitive. It's the answer when it comes to exports and China. And in a zero corporate tax rate environment, if the private sector does not create tens of millions of jobs, I don't know under what case the private sector would create tens of millions of jobs. To see more of this interview, go to the Alex Jones channel on YouTube, go to the featured playlist section, and click on Alex's favorites. So there you go. You've got Gary Johnson also talking about some of his economic initiatives. And obviously he talked earlier in the interview about why it's important to support the libertarian candidate to get above the 5% threshold. We know that the two-party system hates competition. We saw that with Ross Perot. One year, he met the threshold of 10%. He was polling at 10%, which was the threshold on several polls, in several polls, and he was allowed to debate. The next presidential cycle, the two-party system increased it to 15%. They demanded that a third-party candidate had to be polling at 15% in several polls, so they hate competition. So it's important to obviously support Mr. Johnson's candidacy to get that federal funding. Well, we're going to come back with Jakari Jackson, who spoke to the producer of the great film, A Noble Lie. Obviously, it talks about false flag attacks. So we'll be right back in a moment with that interview. And welcome back. Our guest tonight is Holland Vanden Neuenhoff. He's no stranger to our viewers. He's an Oklahoma native. He served as a rifleman in the Marine Corps. He became an activist to expose government lies and cover-ups. You can find him on freemindreport.com and also at noblelie.com. He's a researcher and producer for the film A Noble Lie. He joins us now. Welcome, Holland. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for having me on. Okay, Holland, for our new viewers, can you just take a few minutes and summarize A Noble Lie? What made you want to get involved and, you know, what exactly the film's about? Uh, a Noble Lie, Oklahoma City, 1995, is an expose of the Oklahoma City bombing in the light of new and suppressed evidence that exposes the official story to be a lie. Um, we've won eight, actually been awarded uh, or recognized in eight film festivals, eight or nine thus far, and we've achieved a lot of success in reaching out to the mainstream and showing them that the evidence for the Oklahoma City bombing is very um, damning of the official story, and it doesn't quite make sense. Excellent, excellent. Now, as far as Oklahoma City, we know it to be a false flag. There's been a lot of talk about false flags recently. Well, this isn't so much of a recent report, but we've heard MSNBC claiming that Obama needs a new, quote, Oklahoma City to reconnect with the American people. I'm an Oklahoman, much like you. I remember being in third grade when, when the bombing took place. So how does that make you feel to hear things like Obama needs another Oklahoma City to reconnect with the American people? Well, it's insightful to their point of view because they view these events, the tragedy associated with them, as political opportunities, not as tragedies for the nation. These are things to be taken advantage of and also perhaps instigated to fulfill a political agenda. President Bill Clinton himself told reporters on Air Force One that, I mean, they were asking him why, how he won re-election mm -hmm. when he was suffering so much criticism. He told them Oklahoma City right. because the bombing brought the country together. Now, things with Oklahoma City, we hear a lot of speculation, uh, a lot of the questions of the official story. If you could point out to people one particular smoking gun, or maybe you have a few smoking guns that you'd like to point out to people to, uh, you know, reassure them that this was a false flag, a self-inflicted wound, what would you tell people? Well, I mean, there's very varying, varying levels of evidence. You can take eyewitness evidence for what it is. And although the eyewitness evidence, uh, almost 100% uh, denies the official story is contrary to what the government says actually happened. Let's look at the science because science cannot be denied. Mm -hmm. We know that the exterior truck bomb embodied in the Ryder truck was not the sole cause of destruction despite what the government says. Mm -hmm. So some people may say, well, why don't you conduct a simulation and, and find out the, the, what happened? Well, we don't have to because the Air Force did. As showcased in a noble lie, the first time that information's ever been given to the public in that manner. Um, the Elgin Air Force Base, the Wright Armament Laboratory, they conducted a simulation of the Oklahoma City bombing. They actually took a test structure, a three-story um, test structure that was very um, shabbily constructed. There was no roof. And they exploded a bomb like McVeigh and the FBI said it had been built. It had almost no effect on their test structure. So they actually planted bombs inside their test structure to test the hypothesis of explosives inside the building. And their conclusion of the Wright Armament Laboratory at Elgin Air Force Base was that there were bombs inside the Murrah building that were responsible for the majority of the damage. So you have one branch of government saying one thing, but yet the Justice Department, the FBI, saying another. Now, you touched on something very interesting. You talked about how Bill Clinton got reelected, how he said himself that Oklahoma City helped him a great deal. Would you put it past the Obama administration, a group that has run schemes such as Fast and Furious to run uh, guns into Mexico. Would you put it past the Obama administration to pull off a false flag of this magnitude, the Oklahoma City? I would not put it past any administration under this government because these false flag attacks since Gulf of Tonkin and several since, no one has ever been held accountable. No one's ever been held responsible for their crimes, for their treason against their country in order to um, simulate an attack, a self-inflicted wound, usually a very slight one, to fulfill a political agenda or a foreign policy agenda. No one has ever been held accountable, so why would they stop? Logic dictates that they would continue and that these attacks would uh, only intensify. You know, if it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Exactly. Now, we see, you know, lone gunmen such as Timothy McVeigh, uh, well, they're supposed lone gunmen, even though he had connections to LOM City. We see guys like the underwear bomber, even though we have a witness, Kurt Haskell, who's been on the show, who said he was escorted on to the plane. The, this uh, Batman Joker clown, even though people say uh, he was let into the theater and uh, various reports say that smoke bombs were thrown. Uh, through different locations from the uh, theater, which means he'd have at least one accomplice. Why do you think they lo love this lone gunman uh, scenario so much? 
Because, because it fulfills their agenda. Their agenda is to disarm the American people. Let there be no doubt about that. Gun control was dead in this country because Fast and Furious had broken into the blogosphere and then into the public. People knew that the largest gun smuggler in recent history, if not all of American history, was the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. And they were shipping guns to Mexico to cause violence to justify gun control in this country. That has come out in their own memos where they're saying the gun violence in Mexico, they leave out the part where they're causing it, where they say the gun violence in Mexico can be used to put more restrictions on long gun purchases in this country. That by definition is a false flag attack, but it busted wide open once a couple cops got killed, once a couple American cops got killed, mm -hmm. it busted wide open. Although they're trying to play damage control, gun control itself was dead. But now suddenly, out of the ashes of Fast and Furious comes this new gun control agenda with momentum because of these lone shooter scenarios that play in the hands of the agenda that American citizens, individuals, cannot be trusted with firearms. Now, we just had an article on the screen. If we can throw that back up, guys, this was from the Telegraph. Is Obama. It, it, uh, Talked about the Fast and Furious, yeah, that's the one right there. Headline, Fast and Furious scandal turning into President Obama's Watergate. Would you agree with an assessment like that? Um, no, it could be, uh, because for one, it was far worse than Watergate. Watergate was a minor crime. I mean, Nixon should have paid for that, and he did. But it was a relatively minor political crime, especially in, given in, in light of recent political events over the past decade or so. And it wasn't uh, Obama's Watergate because it did not bring his presidency down. Mm, that's a not very interesting point. Very interesting point. Obama is still in power, even though we have Fast and Furious going on, still ongoing. Eric Holder saying, uh, I don't want to testify, I don't want to give these documents. And it's become a really ridiculous thing. Obama, I was talking to a friend of mine, he was talking about it's hard for him to latch on to Obama, even though he's an Obama supporter, because there's so many different things that Obama promotes that kind of distract from the last thing. Because first we had Trayvon Martin, and I mean, I'm, when I say these things, I'm not downplaying, I mean, it, the Trayvon Martin tragedy was definitely a tragedy, but you go from Trayvon Martin to, to still Team Six, to, did they kill bin Laden? Did they not kill bin Laden? And it just keeps going on and on. And then he's out there promoting the new Batman massacre, like you said, it was just something else to take our guns. And even recently, uh, the Obama administration says they want to come after people for using controlled substances, for smoking pot. I mean, any excuse they can to come after your guns, they're coming after your guns, Holland. Exactly. And uh, there's a lot of people who are frustrated with Obama because his whole, his whole presidency is PR. Mm -hmm. He has done nothing for the people, nothing for those people he promised he would do uh, things for once he became president. People are seeing through that. They're seeing through the PR. That's why he may need some kind of traumatic event to absolve people of their critical thinking skills. So they're not thinking about the facts. They're appealing to emotion because emotion can be controlled. Irrational people can be controlled not rational, critical thinking people. So something may have to happen to shock us out of our, out of our good wits, perhaps, and support this presidency. Yeah, you made a very good point there. People will buy into this shock and awe. So let's say if the, he does pull off a false flag attack, now he'll have the American people behind him. Because we just saw today that certain uh, provisions of the NDAA that were reversed were actually, I guess you call it re-reversed. <laughs> Uh, they said that the, the homeland battlefield scenario, which basically claims that the United States, and well, it says the whole world, but the United States in particular is a battlefield, which would grant Obama certain or whatever president certain, I guess you'd call them wartime powers to act as they please. So uh, what do you think about that, Holland? Well, I think it's uh, ludicrous and an illustration of the, the age in which we live, where, which is robbed of irony. Uh, that a former president, a former constitutional scholar who is now president, his administrations are arguing that the court's ban on NDAA is unconstitutional because it restricts his powers as commander in chief in wartime. He's in fact arguing that NDAA, uh, be the power for the government to detain American citizens at will without recourse to the justice system for the duration of a decades long war that this is constitutional. That is his argument. And the fact that the mainstream media is accepting this argument without laughing in the administration's face tells you that they've lost uh, total touch with reality also. 
And we've heard Obama say that he doesn't need to consult the constitutional issue, something that Ron Paul commented, commented on. And we've even seen the FBI Director Mueller, who said that he doesn't like certain provisions of the NDAA because it, it keeps the FBI from doing their job. Because if these guys are locked up in some hole in Gitmo, they can't extract information from them you know, to solve their crime. So it's just an ongoing problem. Well, that's probably just a turf war right there. But we know that NDAA, I mean, President Obama signed that on New Year's Eve, which tells you that he did not want a lot of press on that because most media, they're out covering New Year's Eve celebrations, they aren't covering the fact that the President Obama is signing a law to be executed in this nation on New Year's Eve. He was trying to hide it. And now he's arguing in the court before the Supreme Court that they must have this power to detain and hold American citizens at will for, for suspicion of associating with, quote, unquote, terrorist uh, sources. And that can be construed to mean anything. It's very dangerous. I mean, like Ron Paul, the fact that Ron Paul was detained on the airport tarmac right after the political convention and accused of being a terrorist threat, that was no, that was not mere incompetence. I know the TSA is composed of a lot of dim bulbs, but they're not that dumb. That was intimidation. That was political intimidation. That was the federal police of this nation. Well, they're not even actually police, the federal security guards Officials. being used yeah, as a political intimidation tool. That's not supposed to happen in this country. So what's going to happen in 2016 when an independent presidential candidate runs? I mean, it's scary. And we've seen TSA, we've all known that they were going to leave the airports eventually, and they are out on the streets. They're even showing up at political events, uh, Paul Ryan, Mitt Romney events. But uh, if I could switch gears here for a second, we have an article, Infowars.com headline. Panetta, U.S. will attack Iran if it decides to build nuke. This came out last week. I'll read the article to you. Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta said Tuesday of last week that if Iran decides to build a nuclear weapon, the United States will take military action. And the article, article goes on to say that the U.S. has no evidence. It says Israel has no evidence that Iran is trying to build a nuclear weapon. They're just saying that they have whatever components. We see a potential Bush yellow cake situation where they're just saying it's over there, so we have all the right to rush in. Well, they've, they've laid the forms for war. They just have to pour in the concrete. It's all there. They're not going to rip down the forms, and they have to take Iran. Iran can shut down the Straits of Hormuz at will, and it renders uh, the expenditure of lives and resources and time in securing the oil fields of Iraq useless unless at some point we secure total security for the Persian Gulf at the Straits of Hormuz. That means uh, removing the current antagonistic regime of Iran. That's why we're going after Syria right now. They're the lone remaining ally in the Middle East of Iran. So this is all a geopolitical chess game. And this latest turmoil in the Middle East over the Innocence of Muslims video, I can only interpret in that lens. Now, you made a very interesting point. It actually brings me to my next article. We have a new article by Kurt Nimmo. Uh, neocons engineering October surprise, and that's just what you talked about, this uh, goofy Muslim movie that's, that's out there inciting rage, so to speak. Uh, Paul Joseph Watson was on our radio show this morning. He made a very interesting point. He said he saw the video, at least what's posted online, and he said somebody getting angry about this new Muslim video is like a Christian getting, married at a, getting mad at a Monty Python video. So, I mean, what, what do you think about this, this new Muslim video? Well, I viewed the video in the lens of, of a filmmaker myself. So I, I looked at it as a product produced by a filmmaker. And about two minutes in, I was wondering if it was satire or comedy, but it wasn't funny. And then I realized they were being serious. And then I realized, well, actually, no, they're not being serious. This is not a serious product that anyone would ever um, try to sell to anyone. This was not made to derive a profit, especially for the shadowy investors that the mainstream media can't seem to pin down. This is not designed to provide entertainment. It is, it is mere uh, provocation and insult. That's its only purpose. And in that, in that case, it's successful. But like you said, it is ridiculous. It is it is comically bad but it's not funny um it's insulting it's emb i was embarrassed for the filmmakers um really? no one could take it seriously and I, I can only imagine that it was a deliberate it's cover for mm -hmm. what's going on overseas you made a very good point i like what you said talking about being a filmmaker when you see films such as coney 2012 this is a little off topic but when you see films like coney 2012 what do you think about things like that is that is that uh propaganda what what is that what is your view on the coney 2012 
Well, I admired the speed at which the message was spread, which is why I looked into it, because that's what we're all trying to do, to compose a message about something that, a right that needs to be wrong, and giving it to the world and watching it explode. That's what we all want to do. So I looked at Coney 2012, and I realized that it, it was fulfilling a foreign policy objective in Congo, in Uganda, over this mysterious uh, Coney who hasn't been seen in six years. It's a non-issue. In fact, it's been proven that the filmmakers collaborated with the regimes in Africa and throwing some people in their movie in jail to be tortured. Um, and of course, the subsequent meltdown of the filmmaker uh, was not expected by those who put it out. So you can see that even though they try to, that they engage in mimetic engineering, creating these memes that are going to influence behavior through YouTube videos, through music videos, through TV and film, they insert these viruses into the human thinking to try to alter our behavior. And Coney 2012 is part of that. And it imploded. It blew up in their face because the filmmaker, something went really bad there. So we can see that they're trying. They're not very good. And for example, this Innocence of Muslims video is atrocious. It's horrible. It's, it's a joke. Um, and if that was an earnest effort, I'm, I'm embarrassed for the controllers. Yeah, people comparing it to a South Park, you know, Team America kind of movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I haven't, I haven't had a chance to see the whole thing, but the, the clips I saw were pretty bad. So as far as, you know, you being an expert on false flags, having done this film, do you see any big risk, any, you know, new target for the U.S., any, anything that we may want to look out for? Could we see that they're rolling out to, to uh, bus stations and going out to sports venues? Do you foresee any, any big yes. event? Well, obviously, like I said before, the crosshairs are on Iran. Syria is merely in the way. Perhaps they'll have to wait to take care of Syria before they go after Iran. But when Syria falls, Iran is definitely next. And that is going to be bad because it's going to be perhaps a joint strike between the, the U.S. and Israel. Um, uh, Iran's going to respond in kind. They're going to respond by shutting down the Straits of Hormuz, they, which they can at will. That means oil prices go through the roof. Uh, perhaps leading to an economic collapse in this country or a food supply collapse. That's very possible if food is so expensive to transport that it's not worth transporting it because no one can make any money. And of course, if the government tries to step in to move food, that's going to be a disaster. It's not going to work. So I think if we go into Iran, we're really going to see, uh, at, least, at the very least, a major historic economic downturn. And also, in terms of retribution, Iran is going to strike back. We, If we attack their country, they're going to act activate cells in this country that have been planted here for years. And if not that, you know, the CIA will activate their own cells and create a wave of terror across this country, small time attacking shopping malls, attacking small targets that will lead to a nationwide rule of martial law, which people will welcome because there will be small things getting blown up left and right. If we go into Iran, there will be terrorism in this country. There will be a concrete police state. I can guarantee that. Yes, you make an excellent point talking about the police state. We all know there are FEMA camps. We've seen it on the Jesse Ventura show, Conspiracy Theory. Alex and Jesse, they go out and they meet the, uh, they meet the people who run these FEMA camps. And they say, or whatever you know, name they gave them, the, the housing units or whatever they call them. And they say, oh, the kids, they're very happy here. And they say, why do we have barbed wire fences and, and bales of razor wire out here? So, I mean, you make a very good point. People need to be prepared. They need to, now, I'm not saying go out and buy a bunch of guns, but go get your food and your water. Be prepared in case a false flag attack happens. Uh, what, do you make any preparations when you're on your radio show? And if anybody calls in to ask you about preparations, do you make any particular type of, type of uh, preparations? Well, I mean, um, I'm not an economics expert, so I don't actually, I, I stuck up on a little metal, but not too much simply because it's not my thing. I rather, I, frankly, I stuck up on firearms really? because uh, not just for use, but for barter and trading. If something really does go down, uh, guns are literally going to be worth their weight in gold. You can sell them as gold and you can actually use them if you need to. You can't throw your gold pieces at someone. Uh, <laughs> so um, that's, and, and also food. That's the big thing, food. I don't want to be having to line up at the local Walmart for uh, my food tickets for the for the food truck or however they're going to try to rectify the food supply. I'd rather rely upon my own resources, not have to sign up for something like that, and to be able to feed myself and my family. Now, talking about the government getting ready for martial law, they've gone out and bought over a billion bullets now between various agencies. They're saying they're for target practice, and now they're even talking about they have sniper bullets, supposedly blanks, that... The <laughs> That, that I guess for a target practice, well, you, you target practice to eventually shoot something, 
you know so what are they gearing up for uh, do you see any any reason or need for them to have all these stockpiles of bullets and new armored vehicles I do not. The logic dictates that society does not need that to solve crime or even terrorism. Good investigation, proper national security would solve the terrorism problem. The national defense problem could be solved by not intervening in wars overseas. The only use of these armored vehicles, all, I mean, those sniper rounds are no joke. That's what the snipers are using overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, Sierra Match King uh, hollow points. Those, those, are real, those are the real deal, 168 grain. Those are used for killing people. They're not blanks. Um, so what we're seeing is the, the federal law enforcement agencies gearing up for what? I mean, what is going to happen? What are they foreseeing? What are they planning for? They know something we don't. Exactly, exactly. All right, our guest is Holland Vanden Neuenhoff. Uh, can you give us your sights? Uh, well, of course, you can check out uh, the movie A Noble Eye at the InfoWars shop. Check it out there. Uh, make your purchase. You can check out the trailer and contact us about the movie at anoblelie.com. And I also have my own radio show, uh, Free Mind Report, at freemindreport.com. It's heard uh, in Austin at 90.1, uh, Monday evenings, uh, 6 to 8 p.m. Okay. All right. And the film is A Noble Lie. I've seen it myself. I very much enjoyed it. And I want to thank you, Holland, for your time. And uh, please stop by if you have any new developments. How's the film doing? It's doing very well. Uh, actually, we just got word that we got accepted to two more film festivals. Great. I don't even know the names. It's doing very well. And we're actually working on a current project right now called State of Mind, the Psychology of Control, which is a treatment of mind control and examination of the concept of mind control on societal and individual level. All right. Our guest is Holland Vanden Neuenhoff, and we definitely thank you for your time, Holland. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. And there he goes, ladies and gentlemen, another excellent breakdown of the coming police state and like he said get ready uh, they could roll out at martial law at any moment they could roll out a new false flag at any moment so just be prepared for that the film a noble eye you can get your copy of a noble eye at the Infowars shop you can see it right there for 1995 a great film to show your family and friends people who are skeptical of uh, false flag situations we see in this film that they, they, well, the official story says that Timothy McVeigh never stepped foot inside the Murrah building, but even though there were bombs found inside the Murrah building, so if he never went in there, how did those bombs get there? And that's not speculation. You can see on the film, the then governor of Oklahoma, Frank Keating, saying that there were bombs found inside the building. So a great film, uh, something, another great product from Infowars.com. And also, if you like this film, if you like our guests, support our broadcast by subscribing to PrisonPlanet.tv. For those of you who are watching on YouTube, we definitely appreciate your views, but subscribe to our uh, PrisonPlanet.tv. It really supports our broadcast because people say, hey, you guys should get this guy on, you should get that guy on, you guys should do this, you should do that. And we want to do that stuff. We just need support from our viewers to help us do those things because we don't have a big corporate sugar daddy leaving money on the dresser at night for us. We're viewer supported by people like you. So support our broadcast. And that's it for the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. The Lord willing, we'll be right back tomorrow night with another slew of great reports. So this is Jakari Jackson for the InfoWars Nightly News. You have a good night.